get our meeting started. It's going to be relatively uh, short. Um, I thought that um, we'd have Michael run through any changes that he'd done to our, our farm aid bill and then uh, switch over to um, H656 that we should have in our committee uh, this next week to uh, start processing and going over, but give you something to think about and review uh, over the weekend uh, when you have time off. Um, so anyways, uh, welcome Michael. And uh, if you'd like to get started, uh, that'd be great. Sure. Uh, could I ask Linda to put the, the assistance bill up on the screen or would you just want to go through it with what's in front of you? Well, if Linda has it there, uh, that might help out because I, I was going to copy that off and this morning and I just went in to do it and I ran out of uh, printer ink. So uh, yeah, if she could put that up. Have you got that Linda? Yes. Yeah. So it, so, um, great. So just at the top in the heading, you'll see that the yellow highlighting shows changes and the blue highlighting is some of the issues that you wanted to um, review. So Linda, if you could scroll down. Um, so I, I just renamed the, the, the assistance program just slightly uh, as the Dairy Farmer Assistance Program. It had previously been farmer assistance program and now you've got section one being for dairy and section three being for other i wanted to be clear that this was the the dairy farmer program um, moving on to the next page um that's actually probably the hold on one second and uh, um i think page three is probably uh, this was the criteria for uh, qualification for assistance. Uh, previously, the on line six, there had been a provision that, that the farmer was actively producing milk and then was going to keep producing milk for up to 12 months. There was a question about how that would affect seasonal dairies, how it would affect um, potentially uh, how to, to determine that they were going to be milking in 12 months. So uh, I cut that down. So it's now that they're, they're just actively producing milk. Yeah. Uh, and then on line eight, this is the issue that I think created some, some questions from the community about uh, agreeing to allow the future farming response team to do a feasibility assessment within 18 months. You had been talking about replacing this with a survey um, or, or um, some other similar requirement. Uh, and so I blew it out as an issue to come back to. I think Senator Hardy said, put a pin in it. Um, and so that's, that's what you have there. Um, yeah, uh, Brian had a question uh, on that, Michael. Michael, can we go back to line seven? Um, as, I, as far as I remember, we asked how many farms were not in good standing in the state? And I think the answer came back three. That's Two, correct. I thought three. Okay. three. three. All right. Yeah. And just with reference to uh, subsection C, I just want to delete it. But well, that's what I had suggested. I, I think we heard, we had a good report from Ella the other day in regards to what they've been doing and could do and would do in the future. If we had some reference to that, maybe it wouldn't be, you know, so demanding or anything. Uh, Anthony, you had a, a question? Well, I was actually gonna say what you just said. We had talked about the possibility of developing just a, like a survey or questionnaire, not requiring them to do anything, but for us to get a better picture of who we're dealing with. So 
we haven't decided on what it is, but we had talked about some kind of questionnaire, maybe based on what Ella had sent us. But so if I you look back in the online, if you look back on line four, it says in order to qualify for assistance. That's why I want it deleted because oh, I, I, I don't want that to be part of it. Yeah, I yeah, I saw so maybe, maybe that period should should stop after emergency in in that that line uh, four, most of line four and five would be deleted. And and then um, right. I, I think it just depends on what you want to do. I mean, if you want the survey to be something that they have to fill out, then then you would you could keep four and five. If it's something that you just want to be included with material, the application material, and it's it's voluntary, then we would probably just get rid of C and work in the survey provision somewhere else. And so it that, really uh, depends yeah. on what you want to do. Yeah, uh, Ruth, uh, have you got an opinion on any of this? I always have an opinion, Bobby. Um, yeah, well, I mean, uh, we'll, we'll <laughs> let you share it with us one more time. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I agree with Brian that I don't like this language. Um, so I think that the survey is is a fine compromise and saying something like shall uh, complete a brief survey related to uh, their technical assistance and sustainability, financial sustainability needs or something like that. Um, based on what I'm hearing from farmers, they're fine with a, a, you know, a short survey, um, just the and that would allow the state, that would enable the state to get information about what farmers' needs are related to technical assistance and sustainability um, without being, being over the main. Yeah. Bruce, Bruce, are you Go saying ahead. would it be a requirement the way you're talking about it? You say they have to do it, which I'm okay with. I just wonder if that's what you're saying. As, I mean, I think as long as it's 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 not too long, you know, if we give them six questions about something, you know, that they can fill out and either send it back in or do it online. It's like a survey monkey thing. That's not that's not too hard to do. Um, and then it would give us us like the state, the agency of ag or VHCB or farm to plate or whomever, all of us um, information on what the needs are out there for the longer term without requiring farmers to do something that they either don't need or wouldn't be helpful. Right, so, I agree. Uh, why don't, so we, why don't we highlight in blue the words in order to qualify and that way we're thinking about both of them together as we maneuver through this. So in order to qualify for assistance, we would appreciate you filling out this short survey, something like that, of farm well, need. I, I, I'm just saying the two sections are linked together. So make them linked in blue so that we know that as we resolve it, we have to be mindful of right now it's it's a requirement. I, I, to me, I've got to, it, it should be a requirement. This is going to be thousands of dollars. I don't think asking a few questions is too onerous. Yeah, I'm fine with the survey being a requirement um, as long as it's not that they don't have to then get technical assistance that they don't need. And I think that was the issue with this current language. Yeah. Um, so uh, you want to rewrite that so it's a survey, Michael, and, uh, sure. and uh, get that in there. And then, um, you know, that agreed to allow, you know, C could be rewritten um as well because uh we well, wouldn't... well Se senator hardy had some some good language that they would complete a brief survey addressing the financial financial assistance or sustainability is that what you said i senator think i hardy? said technical assistance and financial sustainability or something like that okay some combo of those four words okay <laughs> You know, if I might, 
if I might say, I, I also wonder about asking them about the impact of the pandemic on their on their operation. Sure. In other words, we're assuming they all lost you know huge amounts of money, but it might be interesting to get a clear idea of how it really impacted them. Um, okay. Yeah. Is that okay with everybody? Yeah, uh, very good. Go ahead, Michael. Okay. So, uh, Linda, if you just scroll down just a few more lines on that page. Um, I may remember in the, in the first draft, there was the whole provision about calculating per cow the number for 50 cows on a large farm, $50 per cow on a large farm, 50 on a medium, et cetera. Uh, and first, Senator Hardy pointed out that it should be about dairy animals, not cows, because it was always intended to apply to goats and sheep as well. So that reference to cows is removed. And then you asked me to try to clarify that language. And so I moved the, the average numbers down into the payment. So now the program shall award a direct payment to producers um, for large farms shall receive $50,000 based on an average of 1,000 dairy animals per farm at 50 per animal. Same kind of change for medium, same kind of change for certified. Since small farm is not based on an average, there's no language there. Um, and so those were the changes, but then you were in the last meeting talking about whether this is going to be a one-time award if it was going to be a monthly payment. Um, so I blew that out. I'm not, I'm not sure I got a great, I didn't, I didn't have clarity on whether it was one time or, or a monthly payment. Um, I, you know, talking with, with what Brian sent and, and what the farmers have been say, uh, have been, have been saying about their losses. Um, I, I don't know what the rest of you think, but it should be this eight point some million should be monthly. So for three months and, and then it's really light compared to um, the projections that we saw the other day. But, you know, I don't, I don't think our covert uh, money that we have is set up to, to make anybody whole. And those losses that were reported to, um, to Brian, I think were what, 75 or 80% Brian? That's what Wendy indicated, yes. So I, I don't, what do, you, what do you folks think? Well, in terms of making it one time or three months? Well, they would receive this payment for the next three months. Um, you know, it'd be for uh, May, uh, April, May, and June. But of course, we're already by April and halfway uh, through May. But uh, those are the, or for any given three months, uh, you know, starting in, in um, we could even start it in May. The, the question I have is, that's asking? I think we should ask for that. But I, I guess yeah. I wonder, you know, what are we, what happens in August? Uh, who, who knows? And who knows how much more money the feds are going to throw into all this. Can I ask Michael a question? Sure. Michael, um, there, there's a dramatic decrease between certified small farms and small farms. And I wonder if you can just help us understand uh, any justification for that. Uh, well, when Senator Starr and I were, were developing the language, we one of the things that that's difficult with the small farms is you you don't have that that number that lower number right you know you don't know if they have a hundred cows or if they have five cows. Well, you and, know they have less than fifty, Michael. Well, 
Right. But, but then what, what, what do you have in that range? And, and so, it, and there's well, a substantial number of them. Let so, me, let me, let me ask this, a certified, I've never understand the difference between a certified small farm and a small farm. So can you start by just explaining that again? Sure. And when you go to the, the, the Vermont RAPs, there's a requirement for farms to be certified and I'm, trying to go there now so I can give it to you directly. Um, and it's, uh, um, right, that they have to house at least the following numbers and types of livestock. And as Senator Starr just mentioned, they have to have 50 mature dairy cows. And and so that that- This is to be certified. To, to, to go through the certification, yes. And certification, it's not, um, it's not a value added provision. It's, it's, they had to certify that they're meeting the RAPs. Um, so a certified small farm has between 50 and 200 cows. 50 and 199. Okay. Yeah. And, and then uh, if you're not certified small farm, so you're just a small farm, you can't have, you have, one to 49. Uh, I think you have five to 49. Hold on a second. Five, five to Three. Hold on, I have to go to another section to get that threshold. Yeah, while Michael's looking for that, um, you take the small yeah, five. Farm, you got them? Yeah, it's five, it's five to 49. And the averages that you're writing here, are they just the midpoint of the range or is there some data that says that is actually the average? It's the midpoint of the range. And so for small farms is 5,000, that's, that's, that's more than the 50 bucks per midpoint, right? Yes. Right, it's a hundred dollars, right. But it's very, uh, what we did is we took in the three upper classes, we added those numbers up. And at the ag department, they had the total number of dairy farms. And that included sheep and, and goats. And we subtracted out the upper three classes and then that left us that number for the lower that lower class that we don't really know and we don't really know how many animals they they had so we said well we just i mean when you think of the grand scheme of things five grand is is not that much money and we just pay them each uh, five thousand dollars. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I, this is helpful. I just wanted to understand the the methodology. I, so that I'm comfortable with that. I think it should be. I think we should start by asking for three months. I guess. Is is that agreeable, Brian? I think Ruth's hand was up first. I. Oh, I you go ahead, Brian. I would be more inclined to have one payment. Um, I don't run a farm but I think those that do are well aware of what they need and how they need it and when they need it. And as long as the total amount is gonna be the same, I would rather just give it to them and say, hey, you're smart enough to figure out how best to use this. I mean, maybe the feed costs are more upfront, uh, you know, in terms of fertilizer, I don't know. Are you saying to triple the amounts, Brian? No. Is that I I had understood that to be the discussion. Do these amounts three times or or it uh, only once? Well, line four on that page says the assistance shall be paid as a one-time award or in three month in three monthly payments. I'm saying make it all as a one-time award. Right, but but the and, yeah. and that my my highlighting or the bracketed language could have been clear. The discussion that you had at your last meeting was whether or not to provide this payment, say 50,000 to a large farm 
in June, and then another fifty thousand payment in July, and then another fifty thousand in August. Okay. See, and that <clears throat> you know the letter that you sent me, Brian, was even much higher, much higher than that. Uh, but um, I think we talked about adding in, you know, the the difference. We would we would uh, supplement some of the loss. The feds are going to supplement some of the loss. And uh, I don't know if, if um, FSA figured in some farmers being in the PPP program, in the UPA program, and uh, a host of other programs where they were getting money from the feds and our money was was supposed to be to help supplement their overall loss, not not fully make it a hundred percent. Because we aren't, I don't think we're going to make anybody's a hundred percent. So okay. I thought if we did th three payments of what amounts we have here, it would just be more equitable than than one one payment of this amount okay i understand now and of course approps if it goes through the supplemental you know they've got to agree to it and that's going to be a probably a hard sell but hey uh you know we ought to ask for what we i mean i think we're being very fair by asking for three monthly payments uh, that's going to cost eight point some million each month. Bobby? Yes. Uh, sorry, I, I can't tell if you can see my hand. No, I can't. I can't see we're, yours or Chris. We're all in little tiny boxes. <laughs> um, well, I uh, think Chris, thanks for asking the question about the LFO versus just or small farm versus certified small farm. I had the same question. Um, uh, and then Brian, I agree that I don't think we should do three payments. I do think we should think about doing more money, but the administrative burden of sending out three checks um, is I, I don't think is necessary. We give it to them in one check. And at, at this point, it'll probably be June before they would get it. So if you had been thinking about April, May, and June, it's really going to be June before this gets passed, signed, and the checks get out the door. So I would be in favor of just giving them one check, maybe for a larger amount, um, not spreading it out. Um, I agree with Brian that they'll be able to figure out how to spend it and use it wisely. Um, my question about the amount and just just thinking about it, if, if we did do three times the amount, um, for example, the small, the large farms would get $150,000, um, which is more than what they're gonna get from the federal relief package, because that I believe Michael is capped at 125,000. Um, per commodity, yep. Per commodity. So I, I don't know what we think of that. It just occurred to me that then, you know, Maybe we want to be more generous than the feds, but maybe I don't know. So I just wanted to bring that up. And I did want to ask Michael, when you did these numbers and you calculated the total amount um, being $8.8 .8 million in total, did that include the non-cow dairies in, in, the total, in, in your math? Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I, I believe it did, yes. Okay, I just want to make sure that we've the 8.8 .8 is a solid number to include all the farms and then if we did three times that you know then we're looking at you know 20 almost 27 million dollars um for for this program plus i really want to include the non-dairy farm portion of this in this package i think it's really important that we we take care of all the farmers um in our farm relief package so those are my thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Um, any comments on Ruth's thoughts? Yeah, I, I do. This is Pearson, but I've been chatting a bunch. So if anyone else wants to talk, 
um, hearing them. Um, I, I actually think there's, I think a bill that suggests $150,000 to large dairy is uh, maybe not the best strategy. Um, considering that we're at the front end of this in terms of businesses broadly in Vermont that are going to be walking in and saying, holy smokes, I've been losing a lot of cash. Um, and so for that reason, I think we might be smarter to do it in three installments. I also think there's some chance that not everyone will jump in on the first installment for whatever reason. And it might be advisable to give them, give some folks the chance to come in uh, down the road as opposed to all or nothing on the, on the day one. Um, the other question I have is around including of non-cow dairy, which you know, I think makes some sense, but I guess I'd like to understand the principle here. And one question I have is, are we talking about people who have lost money? I mean, that's, we have to be, um, hello everyone. We have to be reacting. Um, the COVID money needs to have a, a, a connection and presumably either a, 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 a connection of cost. If I understand it, Michael, help me out here. So if for example, um, goat dairy has not experienced a loss and I just have no idea, um, we should be careful of, of how we're thinking about that because uh, you know, the, the federal money has a lot of strings attached. And so I, I just want to make sure, I'm hoping we can apply it more broadly to as, as all of our farmers, but I want to make sure we're uh, articulating a clear principle that applies uh, as broadly as we're trying to uh, direct this assistance. I'm not feeling very articulate, but does that make sense? And Michael, maybe you could help me out. Right, so it, that goes back to the whole question of, of necessary expenditure. And uh, I, I think this package or this, this section is really fitting in underneath the secondary tier, the second order effect that Treasury has approved, which is providing economic support to those suffering from employment or business interruptions. And I think it's fairly obvious that the that the cow dairy is suffering a business interruption. The the market demand has gone down. It has um, significantly shifted the federal market order, and you you there's an obvious business interruption and an obvious need for economic support. Uh, for the non-cow dairy, I, I expect that there is a very similar business interruption. I mean, their, their markets have changed as well, um, <clears throat> restaurants, et cetera. And so the, I, I feel very confident that they've also suffered a business interruption. Can you quantify it in the same way that you can with a cow dairy with no, you can't because you don't have that same projected price and 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 uh, that USDA has done. And so, I, I I still think there's a business business interruption. Have they suffered as much, or will they suffer as much as a cow dairy? I I can't quantify that for you right now. All right, thank you. The the only ones that I think are kind of still uh, unknown to us are the vegetable growers and um, you know uh, because they're just getting seeds in the ground and you know they they, they haven't grown the crop yet to and so they haven't had the opportunity to you know try their sales out but um, you know they've had to buy special things to wear and and uh, so I don't know. You think we could we'd be safe on, with everybody, uh, Michael, with uh, fruits and vegetables as well? Um, 
I yeah, I do think that that well, it, it your bill is is structured a different way for for fruits and vegetables. Right. For the it's it's about them uh, applying for an expense um, that they incurred due to COVID, and and that that's that's fits right within, in my opinion. The scheme it's a necessary expenditure incurred during the time period due to covid and and it, it may have led to a, a business interruption or not it's it's still a necessary expenditure so i i, I think that the way the the non-dairy is set up right now i think it qualifies yeah are there other questions or concerns uh, in that regard uh ruth I just wanted to ask the question, you know, Chris mentioned the maybe not everybody would apply for the first round if we did multiple rounds, but Michael, the way that I read this grant is it's not an application, it's more of a formula that the agency of ag or whoever we put in charge of this would just send out. But the, the, yeah, that's correct, but, but they still have to qualify and now part of the qualification is filling out the survey. And so, now they're probably i'm probably going to work in some sort of it won't be called an application it will be called you know a, a participation form or something <laughs> like that okay um, i just want to keep the burden low but I I, right. I I think we should just figure out what amount we are are comfortable with and do one payment because doing three payments is going to just be <laughs> administratively a headache and I hear you with $150,000 going out really early when we have so many other business expenses um, and businesses that are suffering in this state. Um, so I just feel like as a committee, we need to figure out what are we comfortable with? What do we, what do we think is the right amount? Set up the formula and then do it in one payment. That's, that's my thought. I didn't mean to jump in front of Anthony because I know his hand is up too, but I, I was thinking the same lines as Ruth and Michael. So if you have the survey in the envelope with the check, they haven't filled it out. It just seems to add another hurdle for the farmer to go through in order to get the money. I, that's why I wanted to keep it separate. So why don't we give them a period of time, send the, the survey with the check, and give them a period of time to send it back. Uh, you know, I should think most of them would comply. But I, I missed something. What? How did it become secondary? You have to. You have to put some paperwork in to get a check, right? In this scheme. Well, the, the, as the scheme was first set up. Um, it, it was a little unclear if you did or not. <laughs> it seems to me uh, like surveys are online. You can fill out an online survey, do an online like form that says your name and address and fill out the survey and then then a check can be sent to you. That's not hard. Right, right. The, wherever you're putting in your name and address in order to get a check, you're filling out some kind of brief survey. I mean, yeah. Ella was really clear yesterday. They do that all the time for land conservation. All there, there, it's, it's an interaction. This is not onerous. This is, this is, uh, you know, uh, do, do you have a succession plan? You know, have, would you enjoy, would you, uh, would you be interested in talking to somebody about, uh, expanding market opportunity? You know, I mean, whatever it is, I, I, I hesitate to brainstorm out loud because we've gotten, nipped here um but it is to me the the survey is upfront and would enable future planning work so we would get a list at the end of this uh of where we send the ella chapins of the world to try to help folks out this is this is not onerous and it's not um insisting it is trying to facilitate some of these connections yeah well, I it, would, it would be pretty simple if we had questions like you just 
asked or spoke about with a yes, no, or maybe answer, you know, where they could just check it off. Uh, I mean, with their name and address is, is the big thing to get. And so we can get it to the right place. Um, uh, well, what do, you, what do you others think? Brian, you had kind of strong feelings on how we did this. What do you think about doing a, like a check survey but you check answers like a multiple choice thing instead of yeah well I yes I, no, and maybe or whatever okay i just want to keep the burden as low as we possibly can we're leaving it up to the agency to a bag to figure out how to do it but i want to make sure they have the administrative capacity to do it and not overly burden them either while still getting the sort of information that you know, we, we, we are looking for, but I also, well, yeah. Anyway. The other thing that we might be able to do is, um, I don't know how we do it together, but you know, if those went directly to, um, the answers went directly to VHCB somehow, uh, you know, they've got the boots on the ground to cover all these questions and the knowledge, uh, Ruth. Yeah, I don't think that it's we- you, Anthony. I, sorry, I Anthony, do you wanna go ahead of me? I've talked a lot, so go ahead. Uh, I've been mostly listening anyway. I, I think a couple things. I don't think a survey is necessarily a burden. I mean, we're talking about sending somebody a pretty big check and it seems like asking them to answer a few questions is not a bad thing, not a hard thing. And one of the questions could be, would you like a visit from VHCB? So they, so I think sending in the answers to them might be make sense in that respect. I also think doing one check would be better for the administrative side of things. And I don't mind making the check bigger. I don't mind increasing the amount of money we provide the farmers. But I do think we have to be prepared for the fact that there are a lot of other businesses that are going to wonder why if a, a farm is getting you know $100,000 when there's a restaurant in Montpelier that said it's costing them $10,000 a month to stay closed. And they're going on a couple, more than a couple of months. It's just... Not, I'm not opposed to what we're doing. I'm just saying we have to be prepared for the fact that there's a lot of businesses, as I think Ruth has mentioned and others have mentioned, that are expecting some kind of support as well. So we want to do the best we can for the farmers, but we want to also make sure that we're not appearing to be too one-sided about the whole thing and realizing that other businesses need help as well. Yeah, uh, re just remember, Anthony, there's a, a lot of $100,000 in one point two. Five billion. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, if they would let us spend that money the way we really want to spend it, we'd be a lot better off. Tell you, the truth. Uh, all the strings attached to that money are kind of annoying. Go ahead, Ruth. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Anthony, and you know, the farmers want the restaurants to open up again so they can sell their product there. So I think we we have to be uh, cognizant of the full food chain, food system, uh, you know, and make sure we're not just taking care of one end of it, but we're taking care of the whole the whole system. Um, so I, I think having a survey is not burdensome at all, especially if it's an online survey that they just fill out when they, you know, a, do a brief application for the, the grant, you know, providing their name and address and all that. And we don't have to, as the, as the legislature, design that survey. We can leave it to the agency of ag and their partners, including BHCB and everything. We can say this is the kind of information we want, but they would figure out the, the logistics of, of setting that up. And maybe we should have them in to talk to them so they know what, we're, what legislative intent is. Um, yeah, other comment, Chris? Well, just to that point, um... It's not going to serve you well if the agency comes into Senate approves and says, by the way, we can't do this at all. So uh, I do <laughs> think we're going to need to hear from them um, early next week so we can get this moving. Yeah, they, uh, well, we can't even get a, an answer out of them on what their plan is. Uh, <laughs> it's, supposed, it's supposed to be coming, I believe Steve said, midweek, Wednesday or Thursday yeah. of this coming week. Yep, I think uh, I can pull up his email. I'm he sorry, hopes, but when hopes you say 
I'm, and, I'm interrupting. I'm sorry, but I, it's about what you're about to say. Do you say they have a plan that relates to the dairy subsidy that we're talking about? Well, you keep saying the Ag Department's plan. I'm wondering what kind of plan are we talking about? Well, that that's it, but we've been no idea. To get answers out of them for a month. And and Steve, their attorney, uh, sent us, we wrote him a letter earlier this week, I think it was, and and um, asking him, hey, you know, we, we want to cooperate with you guys. Let us know what we can do and when are you going to be ready and what kind of numbers. And, and so we got, uh, Michael got a response back uh, yesterday or the, I think it was yesterday. The day before. Uh, and did, do you want to say what he said, Michael? <laughs> So the agency sent a letter signed by Anson that basically, I think really their summary is that they're working on their own proposal um, and they would ask you to forbear work on your proposal and they will have their proposal available next week, preferably by midweek. That's really something. So, so they they uh, they want to do their own thing. Well, you know, I think maybe we ought to get ours ready just in case we don't like theirs. And and uh, you know, so we'd have an A plan and a B plan um, because they they haven't been very cooperative. I I must say. Um, uh, Chris. Along those lines, I've been thinking, and, and maybe we want to blow through or move through the rest of the language, but I, I've been thinking that after talking to Ella and Gus, that, uh, you know, they talked about the ability to ramp up some of their uh, planning consultants, um, that it might be worth us flagging some appropriation for them in this and also, and for that matter, to see if we could, uh, well, to get more people out and about helping, helping uh, farmers think about their business planning in terms of this transition to try to minimize their loss. Uh, also, maybe working lands, um, you know, another, another existing established entity that could help push money out uh, related to food security. Um, and so I, I just wonder, to the extent we can um, push money through entities that are working, have a proven track record, and are pretty darn close to the lanes that we're talking about, I, I think that would be smart for us as we try to craft this package. Uh, I don't want to drag us down in a lot of time, but it does seem to me that that's going to make a lot of sense. Well... We, we don't certainly don't need to create a new wheel. I mean, uh, you know, farmer uh, help. I mean, I've never, in all my years, I've never given VHCB a task to do, but what they haven't done it in an excellent fashion. And, uh, you know, for years, um, you give, you give them a job to do it gets done somehow. And you know, it's like the ready program. We give them 75 grand to set up a grant writer and they they bring in that one one seventy-five thousand for we paid it out now for three years, uh, brought in over four million dollars. Uh, you know, so it uh, yeah, that's that's a direction we we ought to uh, try to move in. That's for sure. But um, well, you want to run through the rest of the language. You want let? Why don't we settle the one payment versus three? Uh, are you guys in agreement? I've heard two or three of you talk about one payment. Um, I just soon do one if you think we can achieve it. Are you and, suggesting we triple the amounts then? Well, 
if there would be, Ruth said you did a number 28,000, Ruth? Million. Uh, <laughs> million. If this is 8.8, if you round up to nine, it's, you know, times three is 27 oh. million. So yeah. I just, I don't, and I guess I want to be, I want to be as generous as we're able to be and be really cognizant of the optics and the use of this money. Because even though there's a lot of hundred millions in that 1.25 billion, I can tell you it's going really, really fast. So we just have to, we have to be really careful about how we're balancing it. And I know that Apropos is really going to have a tough job doing that, but um, I, I, I think we should just settle on a number that we think sounds good and then back into the math. Yeah. Any, any numbers floating to the top from anybody? No. <laughs> Michael, you want to pick a number? No. Um, the, uh, I'll pick a number you can give me. <laughs> well, um, the Michael O'Grady COVID relief fund. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, you want me to just blue the number and, and I'll say it's a one time award on or before July 1, and then you can, you can each work on proposals for numbers. Yeah. Yeah, that sure. gets off. Okay. And, and sure. but, you know, with my, my simple way of keeping track of the money, my $1,250, if, if we took 27 million, it'd be like taking $27 of that $1,250. So, you know, we aren't, we aren't asking for a great deal. If you get the numbers broken down so you can really understand it, uh, our 27 000, uh, million is not, not out of line, but go ahead. Let's get some of the rest of the language. Uh, sure. Where... It's, it's the well, Bobby it's... Star lessons of decimal points. <laughs> Se yeah, section, I mean... section two is the future farming response team. That's out now since you've, you've decided on the survey instead. Yeah. Uh, then, then you come to the appropriation section and that's really about that number that you're going to come up with, yeah. Um, and and you decided that you wanted the money to be to the agency of agriculture. You want them to administer the program uh, before it had been finance and management. Then you come to the the non dairy, the agricultural producer, um, and you had decided on how you wanted to define farmer as a person engaged in farming and subject to the required ag practices. So it's not about them earning the 50% of their income from, from farming under the IRS code. The, the one question that you kind of have for this section is whether you wanted it to cover losses. Um, I can't remember who had a concern about that. Um, but well, I I think if we're going to put losses in there, it would have to be a percentage of losses uh, because somebody, you know, I don't think this is set up to cover 100%, and that's what they might assume. Any thoughts on that? Well, this is Ruth. I, I, I think um, this is, this is a, a more of a application program than the other one. The other one is a fill out a survey and, and get a check kind of program as long as you're in good standing. And this they would have to apply for precisely because we don't know exactly what their expenses or their losses are. So if someone had, if a farm had, you know, $27,000 in losses, but we had put a cap on what this grant amount is, they might not be able to get the full 27. But if we cap it at 10 or whatever, they could get 10. Um, or if they have expenses and a combo of expenses and losses, they could get, uh, they could apply to cover both of those. So I think it's fine to include losses. It doesn't, I don't think it impl implies that we would cover their 100% of their losses. No. Yeah, I, I agree with that. But okay. if, if somebody sent me 
that when in the trucking industry, I would have some terrible losses. <laughs> um, and, and I bet you I could justify them too. So, you know, you have to be careful um, when you write this stuff to try to keep it, you know, to cover to cover something. <laughs> uh, but it, it is there any way, Michael, we can known losses or proven losses or something like that? Uh, well, th well, they have to they have to submit uh, information regarding their losses, so proof proof of it. And I think Senator Hardy just proposed with a cap, you can control. Yeah. You can control people trying to be imaginary about their awful losses. Yeah. Um, yeah. Other comments? Uh, this is Nolan. Can I make a comment? Yeah. Just know if Nolan Langloff from Joint Fiscal. The other thing you can do is you could leave the amount uh, up to the agency to determine based on the amount of the appropriations available for them to disperse. And so you leave some of the authority to the agency because the amount of you being able to give them money back will depend on how much money there is to give back. Um, so you'd leave it open-ended and let the agency decide? Yeah. Um, you could say the amount is determined based on the available appropriation and, you know, cause you can't make everybody whole if there's not enough money in the fund to make everyone whole, you know what I mean? So they have to come up with some way to make it equitable and fair. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's okay. we've done this in the past where we've, we've directed the agencies to, we've, we, in some of the stuff, I do more healthcare, but we've, there's times where we have said, this is our intent but we give them the authority to sort of implement it without micromanaging it. So that's up to you. Yeah, maybe Michael, you and, and uh, Dolan could work on that. Sure. And come back with something. Sure. Do we have any, um, we have no way of having a similar scale in the uh, fruit and vegetable world. Is that right, Michael? Like a giant, the Pete's Greens and the tiny Charlotte Farm are just in the same universe here. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I don't know of any, you know, there's no regulatory structure no. that breaks it down the way that it's done for, for animals. Um, I could ask the agency if they have some sort of internal or, or maybe some of the the associations like the berry growers, et cetera, whether they have breakdowns, but I'm not aware of any regulatory structure. Do, do they the, have to, do these uh, vegetable growers have to meet any certain standards uh, for water quality or any of that, <laughs> Michael, do you know? Yes, they, ha they have to meet the required ag practices and, and um, Ryan, Patch sent me uh, info about who's large and who's small, uh, and I am probably not going to find that readily. So we do um, have we do have some info then, and we right. got that built into the bill, right? That they uh, have. it's it's not really built into the bill. Um, I thought they had to meet certain the ag uh, requirements. Oh, the, for for dairy, they have to be in good standing. Yes. Well, but you said that Ryan sent you a list. Uh, and what? And how did he happen to acquire that list? Wasn't it to do with some requirement? Well, it's it's about being an MFO or or an LFO. So there's, there is um, the non-dairies, there are seven non-dairy MFOs and they're chicken, swine, turkey, beef, and young stock. There's one non-dairy LFO and it's a heifer young stock. And then 
Ryan did send me stuff about the non-livestock farms, but which I am not finding right now. Um, but there, there's a another, there's another 35 farms that that are kind of in that MFO range. Um, um, this is Ruth and. Uh, is there a, is there a way we could Michael if we could devise language that is is sort of a along the lines of what Nolan was saying but saying that the the, the agencies shall um, determine the size of the grant relative to the size of the farm or something like that um, so that uh, you know we aren't overly prescriptive but we make it clear that you know we're not gonna that there has to be some kind of uh, difference based on you know the Pete's greens versus the the tiny little veggie operations and the livestock um, operations are going to have larger losses and just in my conversations with livestock operations you know the price of beef and the way they the markets have swung for meat um, they're experiencing pretty big losses compared to maybe the veggie people but the veggie people are have are trying to pivot their businesses. So they're sort of in a different category and we wanna be able to meet all their needs, but, well, not all their needs, but be fair to all of them. And, so I, and are any of these farms in bad stand, not in good standing, do you know, or is that? A uh, I don't believe that the three that are not in good standing, I think they're all dairy. Okay. Um, I just got an email from Dr. Haas She's listening and she said that there is a regulatory framework for produce farms under yeah. the FISMA, the Federal yeah. um, Food Safety and Modernization Act. And it depends on various criteria. Some farms are fully covered under the rules, some are partially covered and some not at all. Uh, they interact with those farms according to those, letter, those levels. And if it helps, they can provide more information on that. Oh, good. So that that may give us a you know quite a lot of help on setting this up. Um, okay, Michael. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna leave in losses. I'm gonna build in some sort of regulatory framework, um, depending on what I can work with the agency on. Uh, and then I think uh, working with Nolan, come up with language about um, giving the agency the ability to set the, the amount. Yeah. Is that, is that good with you? I think to start with, that's, that's as good as it's going to get. Okay. So, um, so it, is the, can I just understand, is the entire framework here that um it is a sort of accounted accounted uh expenses or losses as opposed to in the dairy section where we're presuming losses and and or anticipating losses and sending checks that, that's correct yes is there anyone else that wonders about a, a small baseline grant and then sort of expenses on top of that i guess i'm just wondering uh i mean there ought to be some equity i think in terms of the approach to my mind what are you, what are you thinking of for a small number uh, chris well if there is this strat stratification in sizes uh you know pinning it to that or or even pinning it to you know uh the front sheet of their last two tax returns or something you know i mean just just something it, we're we're gonna run into a, this being pretty onerous to administer this is what we we went round and round with the hazard pay bill um and i just worry about that and i think in some ways with the dairy assistance we've simplified it by just making our own presumptions and setting limits that way. And I, I'm struggling to see why we wouldn't do something more in parallel here, but, but I don't know. I mean, we're just, I'm just off the top of my head. 
Well, we will get those numbers from Dr. Haas in regards to um, some, I mean, we should know from those numbers how many like big ones there are or small ones and, you know, shouldn't we, shouldn't we be able to tell Michael from something on that, like sales or something? I, you know, without knowing how the numbers are structured, it's hard for me to say, but, but uh, I, I think you could probably work, work with what, what it is. I, I believe that the FISMA criteria is based on sales, but I'm not entirely sure. Uh, and I, I'll, I'll work with the with Dr. Haas and, and Nolan and try to come up with something. Yeah. Okay. But can I, I just I, would, I just want to go and go back to what Chris was talking about the idea of some across the board support. I think that is worth thinking about. I'm not sure how it would work, but I think I would not want to take it off the table until we're sure we thought it through. Yeah. In there, did you say something about a number of 35 of them, Michael, or? Right, and, and that's that's the the number that I have to find from from Ryan. Um, those that are are non dairy and and non livestock, I have to find that number. Now, I think it's thirty five, but I have to check. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we'll we'll maybe have those numbers at our next uh, get together. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so you want to move on, Michael? Sure. Uh, so section five is the appropriation, which is something that will depend on what you come up with. Uh, then section six, the farm worker assistance program. Um, the changes here really are pretty um, minimal. Uh, I think the real question here is just where do you want the money to come from? And that's uh, in section seven, page 12. Yeah, and based on, you know, the advice that we've gotten from you or the information we've gotten from you about the use of federal dollars, it doesn't seem like that's a wise thing to do. Um, and our general fund dollars are pretty much non-existent. So I haven't had a chance since we met on Wednesday to, to explore the possibility of the public-private um, funding stream that you suggested, Michael. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess, to use my previous term, maybe we should just put a pin in this whole thing and see if there's any creative way we could make it work. I don't know if any of you have ideas, but. The, the, the only, I, I, I'm, I think we should put a pin in it. I have wondered if, um, as I understand in California and Michael, to the extent you've looked at New Jersey and California are the two that have advanced something. I think it was vetoed in New Jersey. Right. To the extent that we could identify a nonprofit who works in this sphere, who was connected to this labor force, and who we could um, contract with or, or grant some money that we then had confidence would go there, would, would go out through them, uh, I wonder if that is a way to um, protect some of the concerns we've had and, and would be workable. Um, I, guess, I guess part of the question is how far down the food chain would, uh, would this data be open? You know what I'm trying to say? If we, if we, um, if we contract we award a grant to a nonprofit that works in uh, farm sustainability, farm workforce sustainability, and then they are uh, granting money out to farms to help with workforce issues. You know, does that is that protective enough? Is that a way to try to um, get access to the CARES money? Maybe. Um. 
I, I think, uh, right, if you go, if that second order um, effect and to try to find some need for assistance, but there's also, it also allows just for public health funding. So if you were gonna say it was about worker safety or money to farm workers to purchase safety equipment, I think that that would probably qualify. Um, Let me ask, are we smart to have a, an entity that would be granting to um, in this line of thinking? Well, that's how it's set up right now. It would be it would be administered through a, a contractor, and you haven't obviously picked a contractor, but one of the concepts that Stephanie and I'm not sure if I talked to Nolan about it, but um, it's the community action agencies that are the nonprofits that are already out there that already administer some funding programs for the state. Um, and so they, they're nonprofits with the personally identifiable information protection in it. They would be um, insulated from Public Records Act requests. Uh, and I think you could do that. They would still be subject to state oversight under these meet the state grant criteria and administrative bulletin 5.0. Um, but that would only allow for state audit. And the language is also very clear about how the state can't disseminate that information as well. So I, I think that would work. Michael, um, you know, one of the organizations that I was thinking of as a distributor of these funds or contract or whatever is the Open Door Clinic and the Migrant Bridges to Health Migrant Farm a migrant health program. Um, and they already work directly with a lot of migrant farm workers. And maybe there's a health connection there that they're just, you know, that they're distributing these funds based on a connection to health during the pandemic. Do you think that could strengthen the connection to the CRF without causing the concerns about clawback? I think I need a little bit more detail when, when you say connection to health, what, what, what do you mean? Like what was the expenditure that was connected to health? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, uh, the, the farm workers would be, you know, coming as patients to these, um, entities or coming as, you know, in need of public health or, uh, personal health assistance, um, and this may be a payment oh. that would help cover that cost. I don't know, I'm just trying to figure out. Um, and I know the Open Door Clinic already has direct connections with many of the farm workers here in Addison County. So I think if you wanted to say if there's medical expenses incurred or health expenses incurred because of COVID-19, I definitely think that that would qualify farm worker, assistance to farm workers who either incurred expense buying safety equipment or incurred health expense or incurred medical expenses. I, I think that that would definitely qualify. That's a necessary expenditure. But I don't think all of them had those expenses probably. No. So that's, that's the thing is that none of them qualified for the federal money. Some of them had medical expenses. Right. You know what I mean? It's, I do. I do. I capture a larger pool. Right, and, and I, th there's obviously a larger pool because you, if you just say farm worker, well, I think you could still define the farm worker as somebody that didn't qualify for CARES Act funding. Yeah. Um, but that's going to knock the migrant workers out. No, they, they, they don't <laughs> qualify, but it's going to bring some other people in, probably. Um, you know, there are people that didn't qualify for UI or stimulus. Like, for example, if you were a dependent, you didn't qualify for stimulus. 
but you could have been a farm worker and you might now qualify, right? So, yeah. well, well that may not be the worst thing. Right. Maybe right. we should talk more about this offline and see if we can come up. <clears throat> yeah, because this is, um, I mean, it's been brought up to me from in the approach committee about, you know, it's pretty shaky ground, but yeah, if it isn't worded just right, there could be, um, you know, some clawback issues and we don't, we'd best stay away from that. Well, I don't think it's shaky ground if we use general fund. It's just that there's no general fund to be. Oh, no, no. To get it out of COVID uh, uh, money, we we need to have it pretty clear. No, the general fund is, uh, Jane must have told you, 400 odd million short, um, you know, for coming into 21. Uh, but that's another half a million, Bobby. That, that's that's only fifty cents in the four hundred dollars that you have in your pocket. <laughs> yeah, that'd take four hundred four hundred out. That would now that's a hard lift to take the four hundred out of the the twelve hundred. <laughs> um, so maybe uh, you know, Michael, we talk to uh, his folks, and we can think about this and try to figure it out. Um, you know, with whoever you chat with. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, we have, some of them have other meetings, I think at one, so. Yeah, uh, Anthony and I do. Yeah, okay, I well, the, 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 the next section was about the, the Spanish language farm worker safety. Uh, and in the letter that, uh, in the letter that, Agency of Ag sent last week, they said that VOSHA does produce um, safety instructions that are uh, translated, I think they said into seven different languages. So maybe you just change that to, to somehow that the agency will um, make available the VOSHA materials and um, to those persons, farm workers that, that need it uh including in the the language that may be requested something like that yeah that that would be fine michael no. do they not already do that michael I uh you know I, I, that, that's that's a great question and and maybe um i can word the language so that uh it doesn't look necessarily like a new requirement but something like shall can it shall initiate or continue to provide uh, worker safety material to farm workers, including in Spanish language, something like that. Yeah, I mean, just that we got testimony, you guys remember from the Dan Baker, the UVM professor about this being a concern for migrant farm workers that they, that safety was a concern. Yep. So, you know, they may have these programs, but I'm just wondering if they're, if they're, you know, widely executed on farms. And I think it's it, based on what I'm hearing, many farms do the, these, but maybe not all of them do. So is it a, is it a, an across the board program or if it's just an optional kind of hit or miss thing that, that would be, because if it's already happening, I don't think we need to put any language in here, but if it's not, then. <laughs> maybe that's a question on our survey. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> this is, this is Nolan, can I make a quick comment? Um, I looked into New York because they, um, Senator Hardy was mentioning there's a similar program in New York and they have a program, but they do it through the Department of Labor, uh, not through their ag department. And they were able to pay for it using existing federal dollars by just hopping onto an existing program. So my, my suggestion is, uh, or question is why, why wouldn't it be Department of Labor or Secretary of Ag in uh, collaboration yeah. with Department of Labor or vice versa. Maybe Department of Labor in collaboration with the Ag because it's worker safety is labor's jurisdiction, not Ag's. Okay. But. Uh, we can move ahead. And then the last section with language was the 
food uh, system and food security future of it, um, strengthening the food production and distribution system in the state. Uh, the agency's letter last week said, don't put it with WeLab, the focus on the strategic plan that, that they've been working on. Um, and that, that's essentially what they said. <clears throat> yeah. Do we need that, this section in there, do you think? Did they, did they say where to put it? Um, let me find the letter. Um, did we all get this letter? I, I, I it was sent to myself uh, and the chair. Yeah, I don't think it went to all the members. Okay. Um, I can, would you like me to send it out to all the members? Yeah, they sure. I mean, it's it's fine with me. Uh, I don't I don't think any of you missed anything by not getting it. But, um, <laughs> I mean, I I was not too impressed, but at least we got a letter. <laughs> More to read, Anthony. You know, it just reminds me that we haven't done, in the work we've done so far, the bill we're putting together, we have not added in any of the sort of nutrition programs, the buy local programs, the institutional buying programs and all that. And I think if we're going to put together a group that looks at the future of food security, which is, I'm not opposed to that, it should be tied to our, our proposing funding for the existing programs as they are right now, and then have somebody group look at the longer term issues around food security. But I'm a little afraid that we're getting caught up in this good stuff that we're working on, but we're somehow not talking about the nutrition programs and the institutional buying programs, which are where the demand is going to come from for the growth of some of the agricultural production. Well, I think, you know, all these things are, are good, but we, you know, I think we're getting loading our bill down with, with some stuff that maybe should come in a separate bill, uh, you know, into the well, future. We, we, we just have to understand as the Senate some of the guard the, the, the expectations and some guidelines because um, you know if, it, if we're going to do what we traditionally do which is sort of first people to come ask get a good leg up then uh, we would be smart to pass this quickly if if we're going to have a little more orderly structure then you know, we'd want to be as comprehensive as, as possible within a budget, but it's think, hard to do this with just guessing what kind of permissions we're going to have. Well, what I heard this morning in the transitions work group that is working on these sh shorter term things like this bill is, is that there are some that are allocated and authorized um, uh, early on the 170 million and then most right. of it is going to go out through the appropriations process and as part of the budget and you know I asked should we be putting money numbers on the transition things that our group is working on and Jane said yes it would be helpful to have numbers attached to them she did also mention that there were some things that might go separate and this ag bill was one of those things that might go separate from the budget um, so, uh, you know, I think that well, my, Ruth, my thought is that we put together as comprehensive a package as we want, as we can, and then we send it to a probes and they, they take it from there. We whittle from there. Right. And so I, I agree with Anthony that we would want to put in, you know, maybe some money for the Vermonters feeding Vermonters program for that EBT program. I don't know what we do with school lunches. I don't know if we can add something to that but you know those kinds of things i think make sense in this larger package and then approps could take it from there protecting yeah. against hunger an option uh, an acceptable expense michael uh well i uh new york just allocated 25 million for that um to to basically direct purchasing from vermont from new york farmers for nutrition programs. Hey. Um, and so 
uh, they believed it qualified and through their schools i i uh, no it was i i'll have to get it more information to you um i can ask i can ask the feed people I, they'll find that for us i would okay think. and correction <laughs> but this morning didn't jane tell you this morning that there's three avenues of of spending and you know the the short one was going through the joint fiscal committee real short one then we've got the supplemental budget which we want to get done maybe next the end of next week and then there's the 21 small budget yep. that's coming and then there's even the fourth one which is the regular three-quarter 21 budget and some of this stuff it's not it's not timely to fit into the short term the short term stuff is to get try to get the dairy stuff and that into the supplemental so that money could go out within the next two or three weeks uh, if you get wrapped up in the um, in the uh, you know beyond that it's going to be a while she did not say that this would go in the budget adjustment. She said that there's a potential that, that, that this ag bill would go as a separate bill. Well, if we load it up, that's where it's going to end up is on a separate bill that goes on and on and on. And, you know, we may be dealing with it in July or in July or August or something. On the, on the other hand, we got a text this morning from a neighbor who saw about a thousand cars lined up at the, the Knapp Airport in Berlin, waiting online for food. I and mean, that's, that's a pretty dire need. So this idea that we, have to, we can put off nutrition and food programs, I don't, I don't buy that, I think. And in fact, having said that, I have to announce that I need, really need to get some food before I go to my next meeting. So yeah. I will have to leave this meeting relatively soon. <laughs> yeah, I think Michael's got, got Just, enough work there to keep him busy until we meet it. again. Uh, if I don't know if you're going to want to meet Tuesday uh, or not, Chris. If, if you do, I'm, I'm going to have to be away Tuesday. Uh, sure. What about Monday, Bill? That'd be fine. <laughs> what about Monday? Well, I, Michael, have you got anything for us? Uh, or do you think you'll if, have anything for us on Monday? If we could stick to Tuesday through Friday, I, I'd be really grateful. We are supposed to be on the floor Tuesday morning. Are you well, not there for that, Center Star? No, I, well, I may make the floor thing, but I've got to be at the uh, doctor's at I think it's 11 or some somewhere is around 11. Well, could we plan to meet? What did people think about Wednesday, Thursday, Friday morning? Just, you know, kind of hoping we bang this out. I don't know that we meet, need to meet all morning, but I, 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 I mean, I will meet with people Monday if that's what folks want to do, but I, I sure would be grateful for a little dependence on some. Yeah, when, Wednesday morning, I've got to go back and get my patch off. Uh, hopefully that it, I'm having a cataract removed ah, and okay. so Wednesday morning I've got to go back but maybe well if, if that's the case then you, if we're not meeting Wednesday then I can swap my life of Monday morning for Wednesday morning if that's what people want to do well we can do it that way or you can run the meeting Wednesday if everybody could meet Wednesday morning you know I, I don't mind the four of you. I mean, you're capable of doing it. Okay. Either way. I, I don't know if like, you've asked me to get the stuff, the produce framework from Kristen. You've asked yeah. me to work with, I, I, I don't know if I'll have, I mean, I obviously could work over the weekend and have something to you Monday, but I don't know if I'll get the information that I need to draft by Monday morning. Yeah you, may, yeah, you may as well shoot for Wednesday, Michael, and if you can, take the weekend off. Thank okay. you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this Zoom is very taxing. Oh, it is, yes. Uh, crazy. 
Well, uh, we'll so, wrap up so you guys can eat and um, have a, as good a weekend as you possibly have. And we'll, uh, we'll see you uh, hopefully Tuesday morning on at the meeting because I haven't got to go until 11. So we'll uh, see you all Tuesday. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah.